Praise the Lord. All right, so up as we pray together. Let's close our eyes to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study that you brought us into tonight. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have a lot in your word to teach us and to lead us into the truth that sets free. You told Timothy through Paul the Apostle that from early childhood he had known the scriptures that will be able to make him wise unto salvation. And we pray, Lord, that these things that we study will have soul-saving impact and effect in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. That the study of the word will make us wise unto salvation. And that the word you give us will be able to give to the people around us so that through us, the two will be saved in Jesus' name. As we begin a new series today, we pray that you open the pages of the scriptures unto us. That we may have real understanding in the application of the word to every life, every family, and to the whole church. Bless your people in the study tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome you to our Bible study tonight. As you know, we just finished a series of studies. And now we're starting a new series. This new series you'll find in Daniel. Daniel is a very instructive book and a very interesting book. And it's very crucial to our, in our understanding of the plan of the Lord, the way of the Lord. And the dealings of God with his people. That's why we come to the book of Daniel at this time. Actually, Daniel is the last of the major prophets. You have Isaiah. You have Jeremiah. You have Ezekiel. And then you have Daniel. All the other prophets that follow from Osea to Malachi. They are referred to as the minor prophets. The books are small, and their ministries were not of, as of great consequence as that of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. That's why Daniel is referred to as the last major prophet before the minor prophets. This book, that is the book of Daniel, is unique in its content. And all the things you'll find there, you'll find a very, very unique. The historic part, chapters 1 to 6. And the prophetic part, chapters 7 to 12. And the book is very crucial to the understanding of God's plan and program for Israel and for the Gentile world. In fact, this book of Daniel was referred to by the Lord Jesus Christ and he assured us as well as everyone that will read, that all the things in Daniel will definitely and surely be fulfilled. In Matthew chapter 24, as the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned Daniel, referring to this book that we're, studying, we're starting the study today, Daniel chapter 24 verse 15, When ye therefore shall see, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That tells us that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he affirmed that it was Daniel that wrote this book we're studying. Not only that, there are prophecies in the book of Daniel. Not only that, there is the affirmation, the assurance, the confirmation that the prophecy in the book of Daniel will be fulfilled. Daniel was a contemporary of Ezekiel, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And he was favorably referred to in Ezekiel as a righteous man and as a wise man. In Ezekiel chapter 14, you'll find that Ezekiel, a contemporary prophet with 
Daniel, although he was much older than Daniel. He referred to Daniel as a righteous man. Ezekiel chapter 14. Verse 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, says the Lord God. You'll find that God referred to Daniel along with Noah and Job, that he was a righteous man like them. Verse 20, though Noah, Daniel, and Job, why need? As I live, says the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Not only that, as you look at the New Testament, the New Testament also refers to Daniel as a man of faith. You know his story. In the whole Bible, he was the only one that went into the lion's den and slept overnight in the lion's den and survived and still came out hale, hearty, and still consistent in serving the Lord after that experience. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. That means then you find the confirmation in the Old Testament in Ezekiel, as well as in the New Testament in Matthew, Mark, and in the book in the epistle to the Hebrews, that Daniel actually lived at a particular time, and that he wrote the book of Daniel, and all the experiences you find in the book of Daniel, the New Testament affirms that, that those things are real and true. The study of the book of Daniel will prove beneficial, instructive, and profitable for everyone. The study will encourage our faith, as you go from chapter to chapter, it will encourage your faith in the veracity, the truthfulness of the word of God, the dependability, the trustworthiness of the word of God. As you look at the book of Daniel, even from the opening verses, and as you come to the very end, and you see the profitable, useful, beneficial life that Daniel lived by faith. It encourages you that you too can have faith in God. It simulates faithfulness to God as well. The people of God who are mentioned in the book of Daniel were the people that were loyal, devoted, consecrated, committed, surrendered, and they were faithful, loyal unto the Lord. And it shows you the result and the reward of such a useful, wholesome, trustworthy, dependable, and faithful, loyal life. As I told you already, the book of Daniel has two parts. The first six chapters, those are historic recordings, while the last six chapters are prophetic. Now, as we think about the life of Daniel, the life of Daniel spans the 70 years of captivity of the children of Judah, in Babylon, you find him in chapter 1 as Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. And as Nebuchadnezzar conquered the whole of the tribe of Judah, and he brought them to Babylon, and they spent 70 years in that captivity. And Daniel will find him at the beginning of that captivity. And at the end of that captivity, when the kingdom was taken away from Belshazzar, we find that Daniel was still alive. And then all through the kingdom of the Middle Persians, he was still alive until the time of Cyrus. Let's look at the 70 years of captivity mentioned. That, that was the time, the period of time that... The people of Judah spent in Babylon. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 11. This and this land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve 
the king of Babylon 70 years. That tells you then that Daniel went into Babylon at the beginning of that period. By the end of that period, he was still alive. God kept his faithful servant alive through those 70 years. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. Jeremiah 29, looking at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. The Lord said they were going to spend 70 years there and they will not return until 70 years are over. And you find Daniel at the end of the 70 years praying unto the Lord that the Lord will remove the captivity and will break the yoke on the neck of Judah that Nebuchadnezzar had put on them. Daniel chapter 9. We're looking at verse 2. Daniel chapter 9. Verse 2. In the first year of the reign of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So then you understand how long this man lived. Because there is Daniel that was studying about spanning his life, spanning the entire period of Judah's 70 years of captivity in Babylon. He was God's prophet and messenger to the Gentiles and to the Jewish world, declaring God's present and future plans. His ministry continued throughout the period of Babylonian supremacy. That is, uh, the king of Babylon having supremacy over the whole earth, having a worldwide empire. And then it went on throughout the Middle Persian reign and even survived beyond that till the time of Cyrus. We're looking at Daniel chapter 1 verse 21. He kept on living until the very time of Cyrus. Daniel chapter 1 verse 21 and Daniel continued even until the first year of King Cyrus. And so the Lord kept him alive. How about his ministry? We've seen his life. That his life spanned many, many years. And in fact, before he died, those who have studied the history, ancient history as well as biblical records. They tell us that it was about 90 years before he eventually died. His ministry covered the period of the dominion of Babylon and the time of Middle Persia and that of Greece, and even he prophesied about the Roman Empire. So then you will see that the climax, the message that he gave, was very, very useful and very great at that time. In fact, he even looked beyond all those empires, and then he looked into the time when Christ will come. That means it was not only prophesying about the kingdoms of the earth. He even went beyond to the time when the Son of Man, Christ, will come. In Daniel chapter 7, I'm reading verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. And he was, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. That all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So then you see that Daniel saw far into the future. Even to the time of the coming. Of the Lord Jesus Christ a second time again. 
to be able to fulfill his ministry. He also prophesied about his first coming. We're looking at Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and, pro and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild, to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks. And three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And, three, and after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. That's talking about Calvary. You think about the prophecy of Daniel that he prophesied about Babylon, about the Middle Persian Empire, about the Grecian Empire, and about the Roman Empire. And then he looked beyond all of them and he saw the coming of Christ, the Messiah. He saw all about the crucifixion, the atonement. The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world. And then is coming again, the Son of Man appearing in clouds and then taking the kingdom from the ancient of days. The climax of Daniel's prophetic message is the coming of Christ the Messiah. Not only did he announce that Christ would come, he also set forth the very time at which he would come. And she prophesied and revealed in the clearest way possible the future signs of future events. His message and ministry are needed today. That's why we come to this study on Daniel. Today we're looking at Daniel. We're studying Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Daniel chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it, which war against it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, were part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of China, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Those are the two verses we're looking at today as we plunge into this wonderful book of Daniel. You see from your outline, we have titled it, The Conquest of Jerusalem, The Chosen City. The conquest of Jerusalem, the chosen city. You find the mention of Jerusalem in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the capital city of Judah. And Nebuchadnezzar besieged each. In the title, you'll see that Jerusalem has been called the chosen city. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 32. Chapter 11 verse 32. It says, but he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake. For Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. It says, it's the city that I have chosen. Jerusalem, the chosen city. In fact, when Jesus Christ was talking about Jerusalem, he called it the city of the great king. In Matthew chapter 5. Reading verse 35. 
nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. That's how Jesus Christ referred to Jerusalem. But now we're looking at the conquest of the great city. The city of the great king. This is a city that had been referred to as the perfection of beauty. The headquarters of the whole earth. The joy of the whole earth. Lamentation chapter 2. In Lamentation chapter 2, verse 15. Lamentation chapter 2, verse 15. All that pass by clap their hands at thee. They hiss and wag their head at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, Is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty? The joy of the whole earth. That's how Jerusalem was referred to. And it was the capital, as I told you, of Judah. But because of their sin, because of their evil, the Lord then allowed Nebuchadnezzar to besiege this city. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 62. You need to get the background of what we're studying. Isaiah chapter 62. And look at what Jerusalem was at that time. Before this calamity. Before this captivity came upon them. Isaiah 62 verse 7. And give him no rest. Till he establish. And till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. That's what they were, but their abomination and their sin brought them low. And now they are to intercede. And now to pray that Jerusalem will get back the lost glory. What we're studying today in Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, tells us about the defeat, about the downfall, about the conquering or the conquest of Jerusalem, the chosen city. I divide the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the predicted conquest of Jerusalem and Judah. Predicted conquest of Jerusalem and Judah. Number two, the punitive captivity, the painful captivity of the Jews in Judah. And then number three, the perplexing consequence of the judgment of Judah. Let's come to number one. We're looking at Daniel chapter one, verse one. The predicted conquest of Jerusalem and Judah. Daniel chapter one, verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. That single verse is the climax or the culmination of many prophecies that have come before. The Lord had sent his servants, the prophets, and he had warned the people in Jerusalem, in that capital city of Judah. The Lord had warned them that this day of painful warfare and defeat was coming. But they didn't pay any attention. The Lord warned them by the many prophets that he sent. And he told them that captivity will come. If they would just turn away from their sins, then they could still escape that wrath of God or the judgment of God. But they would not. And because they would not, that's why eventually you have the record in Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. At that time, the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, how Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon of the Chaldeans, how he came against Jerusalem and set machinery of warfare against it, and besieged it, eventually defeated it. In First Kings chapter 11, verse 36. First Kings 11, 
verse 36. And unto his son will I give one tribe, that David, my servant, may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen to put my name there. That was when Jerusalem, in the, when they were still righteous, and they were having favor with God, and God said, I put my name there. In chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 21. First Kings 14, reading from verse 21. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Actually, the problem started at the time of Solomon. He reigned over Judah, over the whole of Israel. And you know his life. I went into polygamy as well as idol worship. And the Lord at that time began to be unhappy, sad, sorrowful, grieved, pained at his heart because of the direction in which Solomon the wise man was going. He didn't retain the proper worship of the Lord with his wisdom. He used his wisdom to corrupt himself. And now we have his son Rehoboam. We're told Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign. And he began, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nehemiah and Ammonites. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's where the problem began. Judah did evil. They took the promise of God for granted. They took the favor and the grace of God for granted. They took the preference of God. I prefer them. I favor them. I've chosen that city. I'm going to keep on blessing them. They took that favor, that grace, that mercy, that choice, that preference. They took that for granted. And they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. That's where the problem began. In 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 24. It says, Moreover, the walkers with familiar spirits, and the wizards, and the images, and the idols, and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah, and Jerusalem. Can you believe that? The city that God himself said, this is my city. The city of the great king. The perfection of beauty. The joy of the whole earth. The city of solemnities and quiet habitation. That should become a praise in the whole earth. This city now accommodated and tolerated workers with familiar spirits and wizards, and images, and idols, and abominations of the gentle of the heathen nations. That's why eventually God said, you're not eternally secured in my favor when you go back into the scene, to the evil of the pagan heathen nations around you. That's why eventually the wrath of God came upon them. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 6. God warned them. But they will not heed the warning. They were wedded, married to their evil, to their evil ways. And eventually the judgment of God predicted, prophesied, pronounced, proclaimed. By those servants of the Lord eventually came upon them. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts. For thus has the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees, and cast a mount against Jerusalem. This is a city to be visited. She is only oppression in the midst of her. As a fountain casteth out her waters, so she cast she casteth out her wickedness, violence, and spoil is heard in her before me continually is grief 
and wounds be thou instructed, O Jerusalem. Lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. The warning came to them when they were practicing the evil. If they had heed or heeded the warnings of the Lord, the captivity would not have come. The desolation, destruction would not have come. But they continued in their evil. They spawned the message of returning, restoration that the Lord had given them. They rejected the counsel of the Almighty. And because they rejected that, eventually the Lord cast them away from his presence. Lamentation chapter 2 from verse 14. Lamentation 2 verse 14. Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee. And they have not discovered thine iniquity. They still had prophets. They still had people that were leading them in worship. But they only saw superficial things, vain things for them. Telling them, peace, peace. When there was no peace, they had not discovered their, their iniquity. They did not tell them about their iniquity to turn away thy captivity. But have seen for thee false burdens and causes of banishment. That's why eventually the judgment came upon them. In verse 16, all thine enemies have opened their mouth against thee. They hiss and gnash the teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Certainly, this is the day that we look for. We have found, we have seen it. The Lord has done that which he has devised. He has fulfilled his word that he had commanded in the days of old. He has thrown down and has not pitied. And he has caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He has set up the horn of thine adversaries. See why the judgment came. And the Lord is telling us all these things. So that we will know as God says, I am God, I change not. Where all these things are written for our learning. Upon, us, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So that we as individuals, we as families, and we as a church, a body of believing people together, will not do like they did. The backsliding and moral decadence of the people of Jerusalem happened gradually. The kings, the priests, and their prophets uh, sinned greatly against God. And soon the people did much evil in the sight of God. Immorality, covetousness, idolatry, and the abominations of the heathen nations became prevalent in Judah. God sent his servants, his faithful prophets to warn them. But they remained defiant against the Lord. The prevalence of immorality, of violence, of fraudulent dealings, of pride, of covetousness and deceit brought disastrous consequence and judgment upon Jerusalem and Judah. These sins always expose individuals and nations to the danger to danger and judgment because they are offensive to God. Sin is like secret, a secret poison gliding fatally, though imperceptibly through the veins. When you commit secret sin, it's like secret poison going through your veins. Eventually, it will get to your heart. And then your heart is seized. And then, eventually, you die spiritually. Sin is like a disease, slowly claiming the life of its helpless victim. God's warnings through the prophets were rejected. The cause of holiness... And the truth was calmed. The prophets were persecuted. God's government is a moral government. And sin cannot go unpunished. When there is no repentance, there must be judgment. Eventually, the prophets prophesied and predicted the conquest and the captivity of Jerusalem. 
and the people of Judah. The predictions came in successive shocks. And eventually Judah was carried away to captivity in Babylon. In Jeremiah chapter 5, Jeremiah chapter 5, the Lord was expecting that there will be some people that will get concerned. And they will raise their voice of warning. And they will warn the people of their evil, of their violence, of their immorality, of their idolatry, of their abominations. But nobody did. Everybody just kept quiet. When good people keep quiet, evil will thrive. The same thing today, as you see evil on every side. Those who are children of God must be pained at heart. You must have the same passion, and you must have the same zeal, and you must have the same concern that Almighty God has over the earth, over the world, and have that pain translated into getting up and warning the people around you, warning them of the judgment to come. Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. Jerusalem became so bad, so backsliding, so evil, so corrupt, so sinful, that there wasn't a single man that will uphold the truth that God will pardon that city. In Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 and verse 31. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it but I found none that's why every believer is significant in the sight of the Lord it doesn't take a crowd you can make up your mind that you'll stand in the gap in this adulterous generation in this evil generation in this sinful and corrupt violent generation in this rebellious and defiant generation as a man a man of god as a woman a woman of god you can stand up for the truth and then lovingly and passionately preach the word of life unto the people the lord says i'm searching for a man i'm looking for a man that will stand in the gap make up the edge Want the people and bring them back to the way of righteousness and rectitude. Then he says, I will pardon the land. I will pardon them. I will not destroy them. In the day of Moses, God found just a man. When the Lord said, I'm going to destroy the whole of the, whole of the children of Israel. I will disinherit them. God found a man. He found him in Moses in the day of Ahab. When the prophets of Baal were running everywhere. And they were in their hundreds. Deceiving the whole nation. God found a man. He found Elijah. Today you are there. A brother, a sister. Let the Lord lay his hands upon you before the judgment will fall upon your community. And go to them. Like Elijah, how long will you stand between two opinions? If the Lord be God, serve him. If Baal, then serve him. And the people were dumbfounded. He couldn't utter a word. And then he brought the test of fire. The God that brings the fire. That is the God we're going to serve. They said, you have said well. And a fire came. You know the story. How they came in the time of Nineveh. The Lord wanted to destroy that city. There was just one man. His name is Jonah. And single-handedly, without even any team, he went through the land. Forty days, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And God, through that proclamation, delivered the people of Nineveh. 
about the city of Samaria as Philip single-handedly went to Samaria, declared the gospel, the word of life. And then there was great joy in that city and many people came to the Lord. The Lord is looking for a man today. The Lord is looking for a woman today so that your family will not perish. Your community will not perish in sin that you will stand up and speak. There was a time in Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. God was angry with the children of Israel. He would have destroyed thousands of them. But then one man stood up. One man. It doesn't take a multitude. One man that loves righteousness. One man that hates sin. One man that will not have anything to do with the abominations of the land. One man that has real passion for righteousness and holiness can rise up today and preach, win souls, and bring people to the Lord. Not just to be nonchalant and neutral as if we are not concerned. In Numbers chapter 25, reading from verse 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. That's why the Lord is saying he's looking for you. And it's not just this, not just for the adults, for the youth, for the children, for everyone. The Lord can use you. The Lord can use anyone that will rise up and bring the message of repentance, the message of life to the people around you so that judgment will not fall upon them. Ecclesiastes, I'm reading chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Verse 14, there was a little city and few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a little, a poor wise man. And he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Judgment was coming on this city. Just one man rising up. And then, although he was poor, yet he was wise. And the Lord used his wisdom. And that city was delivered. I pray God will use you today. I say God will use you today. That means you have to go out of the house, go to your neighborhood, tell them that they should escape the judgment to come. Tell them of the love of God, of the grace of God. Of the glad tidings, the good news of Jesus who died for us and bore our punishment already. I come to point number two. The punitive captivity. Punitive, that's, that word is uh, an adjective that comes from the word punishment. The punitive, painful captivity of the Jews in Judah. We're looking at Daniel chapter 1 verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand, but part of the vessels of the house of the Lord. Already we have learned that it was prophesied and predicted that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, will come against Jerusalem, will come against Judah. Eventually he came, and then he conquered them, he defeated them. I were told that the king that was reigning in Judah at that time, his name was, what's the name? Tell me out loud. Jehoiakim, you find that in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. And then in verse 2, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now, this Jehoiakim, who is this? This is the son, was the son of Josiah. And Josiah was one of the best kings that ever lived in Judah after David. And yet, this Jehoiakim, he was terrible. The things that he did as the son of a good king, yet he wasn't that good himself. 
he was evil. And because of his evil, his dominion, the people of Judah, the people he ranged over, they came into subjection, into captivity in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar besieged and invaded Jerusalem. And he took it by the strategy, by strategic employment of his own skill and the courage of his army. He conquered Jerusalem and took the people captive. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible does not give the glory of the defeat or the glory of the conquest to Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. What the Bible says is, look at verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. In reality, it wasn't the power or the might of Nebuchadnezzar, of his army. It was because God himself gave Judah into his hand. That's telling us something. An enemy cannot defeat any child of God except God hands over. That child of God, because of backsliding, because of sin, except God hands him over unto his enemy. It's not the power of the enemy. It's not the might of the enemy. There, are two, there, were, uh, there was a twofold agency in the captivity of Judah. Number one, the military power of Babylon. And then number two, the mighty purpose of God. The military power of Babylon, that's the agency of man on earth. And then the mighty power, the mighty purpose of God, that is the agency of God in heaven. Without the purpose of God, without the prophecy coming from God, without the permission of God, the greatest power on earth could not have conquered Jerusalem and, and Judah. The enemy's power is always limited by God's purpose and design. Our God, Jehovah, is the first cause of all events, as well as the first cause of all beings. Men may form their plans. Men may train their armies. And men may organize their work with passion. On their, with their, with passion, on their intentions. Yet, they can only do what God determined before to be done. The conquest of Jerusalem, the victory of Nebuchadnezzar, was just because of what the Lord had predicted. Though this fact was unknown to Nebuchadnezzar and to the people on earth in general, this is the fundamental truth in contemplating the world and its affairs. We should be aware of looking only at the hand of man. We should look beyond the creatures of the creator. The captivity of Judah came as punishment for their sins. And it was already prophesied by Isaiah, by Jeremiah, by Habakkuk, by Sephaniah. Stop, think, meditate, consider. The things that happen to children of God. And it appears it's man that has done it. And you're looking at Nebuchadnezzar. You're looking at a particular man. See what trouble he brought into my life. And see what pressure he brought into my life. See what pain, what destruction, devastation he brought to this man. Yes, that's what we see. But without the permission of God, it cannot be done. Without the purpose of God, in wanting to show that man who had been a worshiper of God, that he has gone away from the Lord, without the purpose and the permission of God, that would not have been effective. That's the reason why whenever anything, anything negative happens to a child of God, instead of fighting against man, instead of looking at man, first of all, you check your life. Why has this happened to me? What purpose does God have in this that has happened to me? Why has God permitted this to come unto me? Let's say, for example, a child of God is sick. Can't God prevent that sickness of God? Of course he can. 
Why has that happened? Oh, it's because so and so did this, so and so did that, and so and so did the other thing. Look beyond that. And look at the creator. What's the hand of God in this? And it is when you do that, you're able to go back to God. After you examine your life, anytime a child of God is sick, anytime a child of God has calamity, anytime a child of God has a, pa a particular problem, and he says, I cannot understand this. The first thing to do is not, go to, not to go to the people who are praying. The first thing to do is to examine your life and to say, why has this happened to me? Where have I missed it? Why has God permitted, allowed this to come to me? Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand. It was the Lord that gave Joachim into his hand. He thought it was his power. But then the Bible says, And the Lord gave Joachim into the hand of the king of Babylon. The sins of these people were so numerous and varied. And they had accumulated for many years until they were threatened with 70 years of captivity. Now the final stroke of vengeance came upon them. And there was no remedy. The corrupting influence of iniquity had affected the whole nation. And let's look at Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah chapter 35. God really warned this man, Jehoiakim. Let's see what he did. How bad he became. How terrible his life was as the king of Judah. In Jeremiah chapter 35, verse 13. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my words, says the Lord. Verse 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them because, notice that, because I have spoken and I have called, I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard. That's why the judgment came. That's why the wrath of God fell on them. They heard, they knew, that judgment was coming, but they will not make right their ways. I have pronounced against them because, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard. I have called unto them, but they have not answered. Let's look at Joachim in particular. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36, reading from verse 20 once again. What's the name of the man that was king over Judah at this time when they were taken into captivity? Jehoiakim, thank you. Verse 20 now. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 20. And they went in to the king, that's the king, into the court. But they laid up the role, that is the role where Jeremiah had written the prophecies that God revealed unto him against Jerusalem and Judah. They kept that role somewhere. And he came to the king into the chamber of Elishama, the scribe, and told all the words in the ears of the king. So the king said, Jehudai, to fetch the roll. And he took it out of Elishama, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudai read it in the ears of the king. The first of all told the king, they said, king, things are terrible. Things are bad. And God has decided there's going to be a great judgment on Judah. And you are the king. Let's amend our ways. Let's return. And let us go back to the Lord. He said, okay, go and, buy, go and bring the road. Don't just tell me verbally. And he thought he wanted to listen. So they went to bring the road. And Jehuda, verse 21 in the middle, read it in the ears of the king. And in the ears of all the, all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the nice month. 
And there was a fire on the hills burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehoda had read three or four leaves, he caught it with the, with the pen knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hills. Until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hills. That's what Joachim did. They brought the word of God. The roll, the book. They brought it to him. And they were reading and reading. After they had read about three or four leaves, he took it from them, cut it into pieces with a pen knife, threw everything into the fire, consumed everything. Verse 24. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king, nor any of his servants that heard all these words. When the people saw the bold action of the king, that he was not afraid, he said, damn the consequence. Who cares for that? What have you written? Why have you written that? Throw everything into the fire. When he saw his bold action against the word of God, they too, they were defiant against the Lord. Nevertheless, El Nathan and Deliah and Gemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the role, but he would not hear them. Some people appeal to him. This is sacred. This is holy writing. This is the word from the mouth of the Lord. Please, king, don't burn it. He will not listen to them. But the king commanded Jeremiel, the son of Amalek, and Zariah, the son of Azariel, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdiel. To take Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet. But the Lord hid them. He even wanted to kill the servants of the Lord who had made that word to be written. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. After the king had burnt the roll. And the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah saying. Take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burnt. And thou shalt say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Thus says the Lord, Thou hast burnt this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land? And shall cause to cease from this man and beast. Therefore thus says the Lord of Jehoiakim king of Judah. He shall have none to sit upon the throne of David. And his dead body shall be cast, into the in, uh, cast out in the day to the heat. And in the night to the frost. And I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity. You see, that's what he did. He burnt the word of God. Instead of bending down, bending low, instead of submitting to the word of God and repenting after hearing the word of God, he was callous enough, cruel enough, and he was bold enough to burn that word of God. And the Lord said, surely their captivity is determined and nothing would reverse that judgment coming upon them. How are you today? How is your life today? How is your response, your reaction to the word of God today? What do you do to the word of God today? As you so defiant to the word of God, when you hear of judgment to come, of wrath, of punishment for sin, that you say, no, I don't care what will happen. And then in a figurative way, in a quiet way, in your own private way, in your mind, in your thoughts, you burn off the word of God, thinking that forgetting the word, not taking heed to the word, rejecting the word, burning the word away from your memory, thinking that will mean judgment will not come. It will make the judgment to come even speedily. In Second Kings chapter 24, Second Kings chapter 24, reading from verses 19 and 20. And he did that which was evil 
in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. Not only that Jehoiakim did evil, his example, his bad example, corrupted other people, defiled other people, and strengthened other people in the way of evil. That we now read about another man that became king and it says he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. And for through the anger of the Lord, it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah until he had cast them out from his presence that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. You see, when you commit sin and the prophet of God and the minister of the Lord rebukes you, or maybe your brother, maybe your sister, maybe a neighbor, maybe any of the leaders, any of the workers, and they rebuke you for your backsliding, for your adultery, for your covetousness, and for your disregard to the word of God. And then you want to prove bold, defiant. And then you reject that word of God. Your defiance will not cancel the judgment of God. Rather, it will make the judgment of God to be greater, to be heavier, and to burn hotter upon your head that's why the word of god is saying seek ye the lord while he may be found call ye upon him while he is near instead of the wicked being like jehoiakim not wanting to repent that very speedily you'll turn away from your iniquity from your evil and then the merciful god will pardon the people of nineveh will then pardon you and it is repentance with righteousness and then having the blood of the lamb cleanse you from all your sins that's what will then erase and take those judgments of god away from your head i pray god will give us wisdom to do the right thing in jesus name in second chronicles chapter 29 verse 6 Second Chronicles chapter 29, reading from verse 6. For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. That's why the judgment came eventually. Also, they have shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lambs and have not burnt incense nor offered burnt offering in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore, the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem. And he has delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, to his sin, as ye see, as ye see with your eyes, for lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are, kept, are in captivity for this. That is for the sin that they committed. That's why the captivity came upon them. Malachi chapter 2, verse 11. Malachi chapter 2. From verse 11, Judah has dealt treacherously. That's why judgment came. An abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. That's why their captivity was irreversible. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and has married the daughter of a strange God. Has married the daughter of a strange God. And you know what a lesson for believers. You see why the wrath of God came upon Jerusalem. Why the wrath of God came upon Judah. If you are called by the name of the Lord. If you call yourself a brother, a sister, a child of God, a member of the body of Christ. And you say you are following after the Lord. And then you go to marry the daughter of a strange God. You go to marry the daughter of the God of this world. You go to join yourself 
and you are unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The judgment of God will come swiftly. Says in verse 12, the Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob. And him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again. Before I read that verse, look up here. You see, the prophets went to them. And the prophet said, return to the Lord. In the language of Joel, tear your heart, rend your heart, not your garment. Let the priests and the prophets and let all the people come before the Lord and weep and mourn and fast. And then as they were told that, then they came hypocritically and then they were dramatized. Okay, Joel said cry and weep. Then they began to cry and they began to weep in mockery against the word of the Lord. Look at verse 13. This have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, in so much that he regarded not the offering anymore. The weeping was to be genuine. Their hearts should have been broken. He no say, break up your fallow ground. So to yourself, in righteousness, call upon the Lord. And let all the people leave all their pleasant things and their pleasures and mourn. Because blessed are they that mourn. They shall be comforted. But then they turn that into hypocritical weeping and mourning. And then the Lord said, this is terrible. They were mocking the almighty God as they were mocking the servants of the Lord. Or their weeping and their crying. And he regarded them not, nor regarded any of their offerings. And he received it, uh, nor received it with good will, will, will at their hand. In verse 14, yet you say, wherefore? Because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. They, they, now they went into divorce. They were dealing treacherously with one another. And then with the husbands and their wives. So it says with the wife of thy youth. Against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet she is thy companion. The wife of the covenant. And he, did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed, therefore take it to your spirit. And let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take ye to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. They said, let the prophet stop all this correction. Everyone that doeth evil is good. In the sight of the Lord. Let the minister stop all this kind of rebuke and reproof and discipline. All the people, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. God is nice. God is good. God is merciful. God is gracious. Everyone is acceptable. And they contradicted the words of the prophets. And he delighted in them. Or oh, where is the God of judgment? They said, this is a day of grace, day of love, and day of maintaining peace. Make everybody happy. And the wrath of God came upon them because they turned the word of God into something that was despised before the children of Israel. We're looking at chapter three, uh, number three now. The perplexing consequence of the judgment of Judah. Perplexing consequence of the judgment of Judah. Daniel chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 1, I'm reading verse 2. Daniel chapter 1. 
reigning there in Bastu. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. That's what we have studied. Now look at this. With part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of China. That was China there. You know, it's different from China. The China. And it's an old name for Babylon. Babylon. Carried into the land of China. You could have read it. Carried into the land of Babylon. To the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. That's the evil thing that happened. We're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles chapter 36. We're reading from verse 5. Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and bound him in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Because of the evil he did, then Nebuchadnezzar was given power. To overcome him and carry him captive to Babylon. Verse 7. And Nebuchadnezzar also carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon. And put them in his temple at Babylon. They also lost the good vessels that they had. And they could not worship the Lord anymore. Since they didn't want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. All the instruments of worship were taken away during that time of captivity. Joachim was the son was uh, the son of one of the best kings that ever sat on the throne of David. His father Josiah feared God from his youth. He lived in righteousness, in obedience to God's word consistently. Josiah's royal influence promoted a revival of godliness in Judah. However, after the death of Josiah, his sons who reigned after him did not follow his footsteps. As early as the third year of the reign of Joachim, the land was overtaken by the divine stroke of judgment and calamity. Divine displeasure was the real cause of this calamity, that is, of the captivity of Judah in Babylon. God had warned of the imminence of the coming judgment, but the people of Judah took no heed to God's warning. The Babylonians were sinful and wicked, yet God used them to inflict punishment on the sinful and the wicked people of Judah. Notice that. The Babylonians were wicked themselves. They were sinful. And yet God used them to bring the calamity, the captivity, the punishment upon them. Look at Jeremiah chapter 25. In Jeremiah chapter 25, we're looking at verse 11 and verse 12. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. I sometimes you wonder, why is it that God will allow unbelievers who are sinners themselves, sinful people, wicked people, to oppress, to attack, to torture, to afflict? Those who are supposed to be children of God. After all, if we say that these children of God have sinned, these other people who are afflicting them, they are also sinners. Yes, that's true. The Babylonians were sinners. But the people of Judah that knew the truth, but rejected the truth, despised the truth, scorned the truth, those uh, people, the Babylonians that were sinners, were made to overcome them, to afflict them. But then after the punishment of those backsliding people of Judah, Babylon itself will suffer punishment. Verse, verse 12. And it shall come to pass when the 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. You see that? 
And that's the, that's the way God deals with people. You know, sometimes uh, you, you find that there are leaders who themselves are not living right. And then there is somebody underneath them who is not living right. And the leader who is not living right will discipline and punish and afflict and chastise the subordinate who is not living right. What do you say to that? Yes, it must be done. Because if evil is not punished, then evil will overcome the land. And there will be no righteousness. Somebody must be able to punish the evil doers. But the other side of it is this. The leader. The minister. The king. Even the king of Babylon. That is sinful himself. And is used as an instrument of punishment for the people that have sinned. That king, that leader, that minister will eventually be punished himself severely. Verse 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. That I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. Says the Lord for the iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans. Will I make, will, will make it and will make it a perpetual Desolation will make it perpetual desolations. And let's look at Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50. Reading from verse 4 all through to verse 8. Jeremiah 50 verse 4. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping. This weeping now will be real. This one will not be hypocritical. They have seen how the Lord punished them for their mocking, hypocritical weeping. But this time now, they see the judgment upon them. And they'll go weeping. They shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion. Where their faces see the word. Saying come. And let us join ourselves to the Lord. In a perpetual covenant. That shall not be forgotten. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. But seven, all that found them have devoured them. And their adversaries said, we offend not because they have sinned against the Lord in habitation of justice. Even the Lord, the hope of their fathers, remove out of the midst of Babylon. Go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be as the he goes before the flocks. Eventually they will come and be restored out of Babylon. And then Babylon itself. There's a perplexing consequence of the judgment on Judah. The Babylon that was used as a great instrument of judgment and punishment upon the people of Judah, they themselves will eventually suffer the great, fiery, hot, wrath, indignation of God. Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. I'm reading from verse 6. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man a soul. Be not cut off in our iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord, of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunk in of our wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. 
Have you seen what uh, Babylon did, what Nebuchadnezzar did to the utensils or the instruments of the temple? When he took those uh, instruments of worship and brought to his own idol temple, he might justify himself. The people of Judah have sinned and they misused the instruments of worship. So I am right in what I have done. And God kept quiet because that was still the time of the punishment of Judah. When the time of the punishment of Babylon eventually came, look at verse 11. That is Jeremiah chapter 51. You're looking at verse 11. Make bright the arrows. Gather the shields. The Lord has raised up the spirits of the kings of Medes. You know, Jeremiah prophesied this before the Median king came to capture and to destroy Babylon at the time of Belshazzar. But this is prophetic because of what Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had done. Make bright the arrows, gather the shields. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. For his device is against Babylon to destroy it. Why? Look at this. Why was the judgment coming so swiftly, so terribly upon Babylon? Because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. The vengeance of his temple. Even though the people of Judah did wrong and they did what they did and God had to punish them. Even Babylon itself suffered eventually for what they did. Verse 44. Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 44. And I will punish Baal in Babylon. Baal was the god of Babylon. I will punish Baal in Babylon. And I will bring forth out of his mouth that which has swallowed up. And the nations shall not flow together any more unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. My people, go ye out of the midst of her. Deliver ye every man a soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. You've seen that sin will always be punished. Though hands be joined together with hands Sinners will not go unpunished. Sinners in Jerusalem, they'll be punished. Sinners at the headquarters of Judah, they'll be punished. Sinners in Judah, they'll be punished. And now sinners in Babylon, from the king to the lowest man, all sinners will be punished. What's the solution? How can we escape the judgment of God? Verse 45, my people go ye out of the midst of her. Deliver yourself, every man, a soul, from the fierce anger of the Lord. The Lord is saying that today there is still grace. Today there is still forgiveness. Today you can still come to the Lord if you have been living in secret sin. And you have been warned and warned over and over again. If you have been turning deaf ears to the watch of the Lord. If you have been turning a kind of a heart that has seared, conscience seared against the word of the Lord. The warning is coming today once again. And the Lord is saying, repent and turn away from the evil of your hand so that the time of peace and the time of joy and the time of blessing will come from the presence of the Lord. In Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and do what? I said what's the next thing? And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. And will forgive their sin. And will heal their land. That's how the forgiveness will come. The restoration will come. The salvation will come. And then that's how the judgment will be taken away. And then we can escape the wrath to come. Let's rise up. 
and talk to the Lord in prayer with a sincere heart, with a willing heart, with a repentant heart, saying, O oh Lord, we come to you. We know that your pure eyes not to behold iniquity. The Lord wants us to escape the judgment to come. But the only way of escape is if you will call upon the name of the Lord. Check up your life, return from your evil way. You know why the judgment came upon Jerusalem? Upon the people of Judah? Because they will not return when the Lord told them to return. They were defiant, they were rebellious, they shrugged their shoulders, they had in their hearts, they stiffened their necks, and eventually judgment came. You talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I've heard your word, and I'm going to respond the way you want me to respond to the word. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked way, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. Think on your ways. Think on your life. The people of Judah committed abomination in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord did not just come upon them suddenly. He warned them. He sent his servants to them. Day after day, rising up early. Warning them to repent. Warning them to turn from the evil way. Warning them to seek forgiveness and salvation. From the Lord. The prophets told them, God is a merciful God. There is forgiveness with him. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Don't be defiant. Don't be hardened against his word. In this church age, it doesn't bring the judgment over the whole of the church. It brings the judgment now, the fire of his indignation upon the individuals who sin. If you believe in God, you believe in the word of God, you will know the soul that sinneth it shall die. Hear the word where there's a chance, when there's the opportunity to repent. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear. Turn away from violence, from sin, from immorality, from fraudulent dealings in business. Turn away from pride, from covetousness, from deceit. Don't wait until the disastrous judgment will come. Bring back the truth in your life, to your life, to your family. Sin may appear pleasant or sweet at the moment of sinning. But it's like poison. It 
If you remain in it, it kills. It will destroy you. Slowly but surely. Judgment came upon Judah because they rejected the words of their prophets. They rejected the warnings coming from the Lord to them. That's why they perished. That's why the judgment came upon Jerusalem, upon Judah. They persecuted their prophets. They scorned the revelation and the truth. They ridiculed the message of holiness. The wine turn hardened in sin until there was no remedy. And God used wicked sinners to punish them. Cruel sinners to afflict them. Mighty, powerful sinners to take them to captivity. And these things are reaching for our learning. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. That we should not sin with impunity like they did. Turn to the Lord with all your heart. With all your soul. While the Lord is pleading. This is the time to seek the Lord. Sinners who afflict other sinners, even though the affliction on those sinners are justified, those sinners themselves are going to be punished like Babylon was punished. Escape from the wrath to come. A day of judgment is coming. Maybe today for some people. This week or this month for some other people. Repent. Turn before it's too late. Do not harden your heart. Break up your fallow ground. Run your heart and not your garment. Be sincerely sorry for what you've done. Godly sorrow walketh repentance not to be repented of. Suit yourselves in righteousness. Then you'll be able to reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. He delights in righteousness. Pray. That the blood of Jesus Christ that is shed for you on the cross of Calvary will wash away your sins, make you whiter than snow. Give you grace and spiritual strength. Now to live in righteousness and holiness before him all the days of your life. 
so that judgment will not come upon you. He delights in righteousness. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Judgment is coming upon a sinful nation. Upon a sinful community. And God says, I'm looking for a man. I'm looking for a woman. That will stand in the gap. And make up the edge. You ought to be that man. You ought to be that woman. Warn your neighbors. Preach the gospel to your neighbors. Be concerned, be zealous for righteousness. Tell them, don't let them perish. Compel them to repent, to come in, into the kingdom. Plead with them earnestly. Plead with them gently. Don't allow them to perish. Don't allow them to go to an eternal lake of fire. Reach out to them. Reach out to them. The Lord is looking for those who have the mind of Christ. Who share his passion. Who share his concern. For those who are perishing, I sought for a man among them that should make up the edge, stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. Tell the Lord today, be that man, be that woman, that will take the message of life, the message of grace, the message of mercy, the message of repentance to the people around you so that they will not perish in their sin. God has made you a watchman over them. You've heard the word already from his mouth. Go and give them that word. Plead with them. To repent and turn from their evil ways. To turn to the Lord. To turn to the Savior. So they can be saved. Make sure you are saved. Make sure you remain secured. In the grace of God. In salvation of the Lord. And then. Take this word of reconciliation. The message of life. To those who are perishing. So are you. And they. Be safe and secured in the kingdom until the final day.